Today's video is full of practical footage for you, all about finishing techniques for necklines, armholes, the end of dolman sleeves. So we're talking neck bands, binding, full hands on, and this could broaden your possibilities in your sewing. So keep watching. Hi sewing friends, I'm Karina from LiftingPinsAndNeedles.com. Welcome to this channel that is all about sewing, limitless sewing. And I have to tell you, I get so many comments and so many questions about, I know you showed some type of binding technique in a video that I really liked, which one was it? I always also get questions about how do you calculate, you know, percentages when you want to know how big to make a neck band or binding. I've decided to pull all this content into one video so this could be a really practical resource for you where you can have a lot of options that you can look at and choose to see what you like, what you prefer and what could be more appropriate for one garment or the other depending on the style, depending on the type of fabric, you know, it's good to have options. Everything I'm going to show you today, you don't need a cover stitch for it, you don't even need a serger. Everything that you see me serge, you could zigzag. Um, needs don't actually fray, so if you didn't want to finish it inside, you don't have to. I could not cope with not finishing it inside because it just looks really messy, but it's not like your garment will tear apart and unravel because needs don't do that. But everything you see me sew is with the regular sewing machine. You know, you don't need special machines to achieve really nice results with neck bands and bindings and all that sort of thing. So you can do it with your basic equipment because I just have basic equipment and I do these things all the time. The patterns do always give you an option and a pattern piece, but there's always things that you might want to tweak, like you might want to change the shape of a neckline, you might want to finish it in a different way, and it's always good to have different options up your sleeve so you can be completely free with your choices and not feel limited to what the pattern is suggesting. That is what my channel is all about, limitless sewing. It means there is no limits really, and there are so many things that you can decide for yourself um, so you can actually sew what you really want to do and what you prefer, you know? I want to start first by showing you how to measure a completed neckline. You can do this either with the pattern pieces with the paper or you can actually get your pattern pieces already cut out from fabric and measure from there. And I'm going to show you how to measure circumferences for necklines in two different ways. Most patterns for knits actually call for a 3-8 seam allowance, so the neckband piece or binding piece or whatever type of piece the pattern has will include 3-8 seam allowance. That means that you're sewing that piece to the edge at 3-8 seam allowance. So when you want to measure your circumference to see how much it is, if you want to confirm what percentage this pattern is using, or you want to change that neckline, make it lower or make it higher, and then you have a different shape here, you need to measure to see how big to make your band or your binding with. So I'm going to show you how to do that when the pattern is drafted with a 3-8 seam allowance. So have a look at that. You can measure the circumference of whatever top you're making from the pattern pieces themselves from the paper. You can pin them at the shoulder seams with the seam allowance that they have. It's usually 3 eighths of an inch for knits. But you can also do it with your garment and sometimes I like doing it with my garment. So I have my pattern pieces here. This is the back, this is the front. So they are both on the fold and I've got the shoulder seams. They're pinned at the seam allowance that is going to be used. So if your pattern is using a 3 8 seam allowance, that means that the neck band or the binding will be sewn on 3 8 of an inch from the edge. So that is where you actually want to know what the measurement is, not from the edge of the fabric. You'll get a wrong measurement there. So you grab your tape measure and put it 3 8 away from the edge. You know, you don't have to draw this in. Um, I eyeball the 3 8 because it's sort of easier to do. And these cheap tape measures are flexible. You can just move it around. And I get 14 inches here. So we know the total circumference of this is 14 times 2 because I've only measured half of it there. And that's 28. If you have a really, really lightweight, stretchy fabric, like a really lightweight rayon spandex, I would probably do 80% of that for the length of the neckband or binding. So you multiply that by 0.8 and you will get 22.4. Now if your fabric is just your standard rayon spandex, cotton spandex, I would do 85%. 
So you have your total circumference times 0.85, that would be 23.8. And now if I was using a band or binding that was more structured, it doesn't necessarily mean that the main fabric is the same. Sometimes you use a contrast or you're using Ponty or something that is just, you know, heavier weight. I would do 90%. So 28 times 0.9 is 25.2. Now to all those measurements, you want to add 3 quarters of an inch for seam allowance on each ends of these bands or bindings. For this specific case, I will be using 85%. So 28 times 0.85 is 23.8 plus 3 quarters of an inch, which is 0.75 in decimals. And my binding needs to be 24.5. I'll just estimate. So I have my binding piece here. I use a standard of one and a half inches there. And then the length just depends on what I'm doing. And I'll just mark 24 and a half right there. When I'm sewing myself and I'm not showing like a sew along or trying to follow the instructions. When I sew on my own terms, I prefer using a quarter of an inch seam allowance to finish necklines and armholes and things like that. And also I sometimes look at the pattern pieces provided and I just measure them for reference, but I like drafting my own. But I do like to use a quarter of an inch seam allowance. So that means I measure in a little bit of a different way. Very similar though. So let's see what the difference is there. Now the same pattern, I want to use a quarter of an inch seam allowance to attach onto the neckline. That is a standard that I like to use. No matter what the pattern says, I like to use a quarter of an inch because it's just easier and less bulky there on the curve here. So I'm going to measure from the edge at a quarter of an inch. So just a bit closer than what I measured before at a quarter of an inch and I'm going to get a different measurement now. Now I get 13 and a quarter. So my measurement is smaller now because I'm measuring closer to the edge. If you made a mistake and measured at the edge, just like that, you're going to get a really small measurement. Whatever calculation you do, you get 12 and three quarters if you measure from the edge. But that's not the right measurement. If you take that measurement to calculate your bands or your bindings, you're going to get one that's just too short and it'll turn out packet and not looking good. It's not the correct measurement. So at a quarter of an inch, I got 13 and a quarter inches. 13 and a quarter inches and times two because I need the full circumference. 26 and a half is what the full circumference of this neckline measured a quarter of an inch away from the edge, which is the seam allowance I want to use. Times 0.85 is 22.5 and I want to add three quarters of an inch for seam allowance plus 0.75. And my band should measure, my band or binding should measure 23.2. Marked in blue where my binding would finish for what I want to do at a quarter of an inch from the edge. And then the red line is longer and that's what I would need if I was sewing this at 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance. So you can see the band is slightly shorter for a smaller seam allowance than it is for a slightly larger seam allowance. I hope all these numbers are not making you dizzy. I am putting imperial and metric there on the screen so none of you miss out. This is just an example. This is actually a garment I will make in the future. I've already got it cut out so that's why I decided to measure that for you. And to show you the length that I'm taking into account, now that length can be good for a binding or a neckband. These pieces can be that length that is either 80, 85, 90, whatever. And how tall that piece is will depend on the type of technique you're using and the different look that you want. So it's all very variable. Now I've just shown you how to measure necklines. What about sleeveless armholes? You know, I wouldn't suggest measuring like I did the neckline, like, like you fold it and just get half of the total measurement. It's different because for an armhole, you have two seams. You have a shoulder seam and a side seam. So you will find that the front arm side has a different length to the back because they usually have a different shape. So it's better to measure them separately and this is how it's done. To measure the circumference of a sleeveless armhole, you don't just measure half of it like you know I did on the neckline. I think you should just measure the front separately and the back separately and add them. Discounting the seam allowance, you would have 3 8 seam allowance there that you don't count and you don't count the seam allowance there for the shoulder seams. So from the edge in, 3 8 that's what you would measure there up to there. And the same for this one. And depending on what type of finishing you're going to do to this armhole, whether it's going to be band or binding or the seam allowance you're going to use, whether you're going to measure 
3 8 away from the edge like that or if you're just going to measure closer and measure at a quarter of an inch from the edge and get your measurement for the front get your measurement for the back add that you'll get a total number and that's how you calculate the length of your band or your binding that you need to do so when you have a number for your finished armhole you have a total circumference number and then you apply and multiply by 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 0 0.9 whatever it is that you want to do depending on the type of fabric. I've got a few scraps of types of rayon spandex to show you and other types of knits to just try and show you how I decide whether it's 80%, 85%, 90%. So I have this rayon spandex, it's just a solid, it is very lightweight, it is very flimsy, it is very stretchy. And for this type, I know that if I use 85%, it would be too long and my neckline is going to gape a little bit. So I would use 80% for a solid rayon spandex like that, that is super lightweight. Then I have this other rayon spandex that is also very lightweight. And just look how much, I mean, this is just, yeah. So 80% for this is good. It's going to work okay. And that is sort of my standard for fabrics that I touch that I feel like this. Now I have another rayon spandex that I feel is heavier weight than those. It's printed, um, there's like paint on it and that immediately makes it less stretchy. Look, less stretchy, a bit heavier weight. So 85% would be good for this. And I can feel it, I can feel the difference. If you have a bag of scraps, go and feel the difference between your scraps and your types of fabrics and that will give you a really good feel to make those types of decisions like that. This is a light to medium weight cotton spandex. It's stretchy, it's nice, it has good recovery, 85% is perfectly fine for this. I think if I did shorter and if I did 80, it would pucker, if I did 90, it would gape. So it's all about the feel. This is an athletic knit, it is medium weight, it's heavier than the ones I've shown you. It is stretchy but less stretchy. So if I were to do binding, for example, I would probably cut this at 90%. Now I have some heavy cotton spandex that I use for yoga waistbands. Usually it's quite heavy weight, 10% spandex, you know, structured knit. Same as Ponty, for those I would use 90%. I would try to not make bands, neck bands with those. It's just too structured, it's not gonna look very nice. I think a binding would look nicer. And for those heavier fabrics, I would use 90%. I wouldn't use shorter because it, it will pack, it, will, it won't look good. So keeping that in mind, when you see a pattern that has a band or a binding piece, you don't usually know what a designer has taken into account to make that shorter because it will always be shorter than the circumference of the neckline or the armhole. It will always be smaller, but you don't really know. I like to measure and find out. There's so many variations that can happen with a knit garment. So you at home can choose the knit fabric that you want according to the pattern uh, suggestions. But the knit fabrics are so different between themselves and they have different stretch factors and so you can have a really different result with the same neckband for one fabric and for the other so i like to know measure compare and adjust to what my fabric is telling me whether i want it shorter 80 just typical 85 or a tad bit longer at 90 depending on the stretch or the weight of the fabric i want to show you now how to sew on a typical neckband that is included in a pattern in this tutorial, I did use the pattern piece provided in the pattern. I did everything as per usual. I had measured before and thought, yeah, it was okay. It was all good. So let's see how to sew a typical neckband using 3-8 seam allowance. This is a neckband. I have just sewn it there on the ends. That just needs to be opened and folded onto itself. I'm going to put a pin through there like that. This just needs to be folded onto itself and I like to divide these into quarters, into four. Some people do it into eights and that is even more precise. So I've got one there and then on this other half I'm going to put another pin. When you divide this again, so now putting the pin with the pin then you get the quarters, right? Because half of a half is a quarter. So I'm going to put a pin there and then the other pin over here. So that's essentially divided the neckband into four. One, two, three, four. Now I'm gonna mark my neckline with quarters, with pins, and then match this to that neckline. I'm just gonna put those shoulder seams together there, 
and I'm just going to put a pin there to hold them together not that that is a reference of anything so this helps me mark the center of the front there right there so that is a reference point and then I do the same with the back here that is the middle of the back now I'm going to take this pin that I have put there and then open this again then I'm going to match these two pins there so these mark the front and the back centers and I'll just put them together there and now over here where the fabric ends and you have the fold that is going to be one of the quarters so you're not matching the references that you did with the neck band to the shoulder seams because the shoulder seams is never a quarter of the neck it's always sort of um, onto the front you know the front neckline takes up more circumference than the back so here as well you can see the reference there and then that's where it ends over here on the fold and the other pin so this is how I divide the neck line into four I'm gonna remove that so I have a pin there I have a pin there I have a pin there and I have a pin there those are my quarters for the neckline and I have my quarters for the neck band I like to put the seam of the neck band on the center back I have hair there no one's gonna see it so that's where I put it so I'm gonna put the neck band on top of the neckline and just match those pins there that one's matched there and now the next quarter here is going to match the next pin the neckline is going to be bigger than the neckband and that's what keeps it from gaping and looking bad so it needs to be smaller always if you do a neckband that's the same circumference as your neckline it's never going to be a good look so here i'm matching the next quarter And then the last one here. So look, you can see right there from one pin to the next, there's the neckband and then there's excess here because the neckline is bigger. So when I sew this together, I have to stretch it like that and then sew as I meet one pin to the next. And I sew this with a zigzag stitch. It doesn't really matter what quarter you start on. I'm just gonna start here. So it's a 3 8 seam allowance. My needle down, get rid of that first pin. I always have the other pin in my hand and I stretch it slightly, the neck band, to match. I also want to make sure that the shoulder seam is pointing in the right direction. So I have my sleeve seam there and I can touch it and I can tell that the seam of the shoulder is coming this way. I'm approaching the seam of the neckband right there where that pin is so I'm just going to slow down there and go over carefully over that bulk then I grab my other pin and make sure I'm stretching slightly just to have them both match I'm approaching the shoulder seam again on the other side here is the sleeve and on this case the seam is going that way so I just want to keep my finger there and make sure it's sewn in the same direction. So if you have a serger, there are lots of people that do this step directly on the serger. They don't sew it on the sewing machine. My serger does not hold a seam so my serger is just for finishing seams but it doesn't have the strength to hold a seam it would be very wonky so i just sew it on with my normal sewing machine with a narrow zigzag stitch it's going to stretch and then i go and search the edge just to clean it up it looks very nice i never ever go and top stitch there i think with my sewing machine if i wanted to go and top stitch that down it would look terrible and it would just ruin the whole top for me I don't think it's necessary so you'll never see me top stitch that down the neckline is slightly screwed but it's not low at all I mean it's very nice it's like an inch below the collarbones and that's where I like it and the rib knit works really well no gaping it's just really nice what happens when the pattern that you have 
the uh, cause for binding or facings or, or other techniques and you just really set on doing your own neck band. So I have a standard, if I don't have a neck band piece, I'll put a diagram here. My neck band will be two inches tall, like that. And the length will vary depending on the circumference of the type of fabric. That could be 80, 85, 90% of the total circumference. And I've shown you how to measure that. And I'll show you how to sew that next. I'm just gonna sew a regular neck band onto the edge of the neckline. I've just cut a standard that I like that is two inches there and the length of it, I measured the neckline and calculated 80% of that. So 20% shorter because this fabric is mega stretchy. So anywhere from 80 to 85 works fine with rayon spandex for me. And I've just chosen 80 in this opportunity. I've divided this in four. You can see the pins there, the red ones, where I've divided that in four. And this is the neckline of the dress. And I've also divided that in four with the, you can see that with the yellow pins there. So I'm just gonna match these red pins to the yellow pins, each of these quarters in four points. And then I'm gonna serge the edges around. This is my green, super powerful <laughs> semi-industrial overlocker. It's very loud, vibrates a lot. So I'll put music when I actually sew, but I've got the neckband there on top of the neckline. This is one of the quarters I've marked and the neckline is bigger. So I'm stretching the neckband slightly as I sew these together on the edge. The main goal of this serge is to finish edges and it's a three thread. So it's not strong enough to hold the neckband just like that, in my opinion. That's why I always go in and sew at a quarter of an inch with a, a shallow zigzag stitch just to reinforce that. The zigzag stitch will allow this to stretch. So you can see it's shallow, it looks wavy, but mainly like a straight stitch and it allows this to stretch. You can see it better on the white side of the rayon. See, wavy, stretchy. So I'll do that all the way around and that's it. I don't stitch down neck bands. I don't top stitch them. I don't enjoy doing that. I don't think it's necessary. So that this is the easiest way to finish this neckline. This one is finished with a neckband. Traditional way to finish a neckline is the easiest one that you can do. And it also looks really nice. 80% length worked really good. It's nice and flat against my chest and I don't have gaping. So that is a standard, you know, if you like how my neck bands look, you could adopt it yourself. This is how it looks finished. If you cut it at two inches, fold it onto itself and then sew it at a quarter of an inch seam allowance. It's not wide, it's not thin. I think it looks nice. And it'll be the standard you see me make with neck bands. I want to point out something about neck bands and fabrics with stripes. This is a title top from Love Notions and I've used rayon spandex that has stripes. Although I have placed the stripes on the bias there. Normally that would be the direction of the fabric. So the stripes would go horizontal and the greatest stretch of the fabric would be this way. Not vertically like this, not up and down. I have seen some neck bands done with this piece cut up and down. So you have stripes like this, like that. And I would recommend against, it might look cute, it might look pretty, but that is not the direction where the greatest stretch is on your neck band. And if you cut your neck piece as per the instructions, it might end up being too short. It doesn't stretch. Vertical stretch is less, so you might end up with a really puckered neckline. So just try to keep your neck band on stripes going horizontal. You know, just cut it the way it's supposed to be. On the neck band piece, it always says to cut on this direction of the greatest stretch, you know, not up and down the fabric, but across like that, as the same as all the other pieces. And it might look a little bit boring, but it will turn out functionally better than having the stripes going like this. Now, I want to touch on armbands as well, because they're a great way to finish off the edge of a sleeve, depends on what it is. It could be a sleeveless armhole, it could be a dropped shoulder style or just a plain dolman sleeve. What I have here is the same as what I've got here, one of the Uvita tops I showed in my previous video. And this one has a dropped shoulder style shape there. You can see it's curved, it's like that. It's not a straight thing like that. 
and that was supposed to have a sleeve but I didn't put a sleeve I put an armband so you know to measure the circumference it was really easy measured it when it was already finished and a quarter of an inch away from the edge and then drafted my armband piece that is always two inches tall and then the length varies you know that's easy and you know you can do that some styles are designed like that you know this is a Miri dress from Wardrobe by Me and you can see that this style finishes and it has that same drop shoulder style. It also has that type of curve and this one is finished with an armband in the pattern. So it is an official thing you can do, you know, some styles are designed like that, others are not. But an armband is a feature that you can add to a drop shoulder style or to a dolman style very easily instead of hemming it. And sometimes it's just easier than hemming it, right? This is one of my La Bella Donna tops from Love Notions. And this one has an armband sewn on the edge of this dolman sleeve. Dolman sleeve is you're usually just straight. So it's really easy to measure that circumference and to calculate. It's made at 85% there according to the pattern instructions. And it's good, you know, it's good that it brings this in because it allows you to have a closed um, opening here so when you lift your arms you're not going to see in through the side and see your bra and things like that so that's why it's designed like that but depending on the fabric you know you could choose 85 or 90 and I've done either or depending on the style and depending on the fabric but sewing these on is so easy um, I don't really divide these into quarters to match to the edge because it's just such a small you know little thing you can mark with pins a half point of this area and then the half point of the armband and match them up, stretch lightly the armband to match and sew it on and you can see that here. The band is on the outside of the sleeve as you can see there. There's just the inside of the dolman sleeves, nothing there. And this goes around matching the seam there to the side seams at the bottom. And now this just gets sewn on the round. Just dab, serge and sew as per usual. One you just saw was from the knit vivace dolman pattern that uses 3 8 of an inch seam allowance so that's what i've shown you there but when i do it on my own terms i like using a quarter of an inch it's just less bulky and you know even if i sew it 3 8 of an inch as per the pattern sometimes i'll go and trim away to a quarter because it's just less bulky around these areas so I, it's just a personal preference of mine that i like to share with you maybe you can try that and see if you enjoy sewing with smaller seam allowances and the quarter inch foot, uh, I know it's for quilting and stuff, but I use it daily. I use my presser feet all the time and they always help to get a really nice result. Next, I want to touch on binding. Binding can be done in all sorts of different ways and sometimes it's not included in the pattern. That's not an official way to finish, but depending on the fabric, you might want to try that. And I did this with the talent dress from Itch to Stitch at the beginning of the year. This had a different binding technique that I'll show you later, but I just did the regular one where it's folded in the front and the back, so it completely covers that raw edge there of the fabric. With this technique, you don't lose seam allowance, so you don't you lose depth or width or anything. And depending on the size of the binding you make, how big it's gonna be. So in this case, it's narrow. It's only a quarter of an inch wide there, but it can be wider. It can be three eighths of an inch. So I'm going to show you how to sew these, how to make the binding pieces. This is a structured leather look jersey that is different to the ITY and the percentage of the length around here is related to what I'm using for the binding, not what I'm using for the main fabric. After having measured my new circumference around there, I want to finish the neckline with this leather look jersey that I've used in the past because this knee is quite structured. I can easily pass it through a bias tape maker just for the folds. This is a jersey, so it's not cut on the bias, it's just cut normal. So this is the one that says 18 at the back. That means that the finished width of this after being double folded is gonna be 18 millimeters wide. I found the width of this area for this double fold to fold over nicely and not meet exactly in the middle so that it's not so bulky when it's folded like that. I found my preferred width here is 
3.2 inches is one and a quarter. But one and a quarter there by the length that you determine based on the stretch of the material you're using. Like this ITY is super stretchy, right? But this isn't ITY, this isn't as stretchy as ITY. So I have calculated 90%. I've got my binding right sides together with a dress. You can see the shiny side is my right side because that's the one I want to be seen. So I've corded that, divided into four, and then done the same to the neckline. The neckline is bigger, of course, and I'll be stretching the binding to match the neckline as I sew with a straight stitch. And I'm just going to be sewing on the first fold there that I managed to press with my bias tape maker. And I just wanted it for the neat folds, you know. So I'm just going to be using a straight stitch for that. So I've sewn that on, stretching the binding as I went to get it to fit this circumference and now the shiny bit is there and the other fold is there so I'm going to keep that fold keep that seam allowance up and bring it down to meet that seam there so it's basically wrapping over that seam allowance there so I'm going to go and hand baste this on to the edge and then top stitch and on the inside it's going to be really nice and neat cut your binding one and a quarter inches tall by whatever length you want and you pass that through a bias tape maker that is 18 on the back you'll get the pieces that I got which means that you can sew these on at a quarter of an inch to the raw edge of the neckline so same exact technique for the armholes there and you will get that result that you see there super easy the hand basting always makes it so much better and these are sewn on traditionally you know where you sew it on the right side and then you flip it to the inside and then you top stitch here you can see my leather look jersey i love the look of that i think it looks different same as here i really really like how this binding technique worked for this fabric now if you wanted your binding to just look wider there not look so narrow and maybe on heavier fabric it's better that way if you want that binding to look 3 8 of an inch wide you can cut that binding piece one and three quarters inches tall so a little bit taller half an inch taller than this one i've already shown you and then you sew it in the exact same way and you'll get binding that is three eighths of an inch wide there so if you compare the width of those, this is at a quarter of an inch seam allowance, this is at three eighths of an inch seam allowance. This binding piece is one and an inch quarter tall, this one's one and three quarters inch tall. So that means you're sewing this at three eighths of an inch seam allowance and then wrapping it around that amount to the back and sewing it. You know, you can do the binding at whatever width you think is more appropriate. For lightweight fabrics, I like narrow binding. For heavier ones, I like wider wider binding now the binding I've just shown you you can do it even easier and you can sew it on in reverse which means that you put the binding right side of the binding to the wrong side of the neckline or armhole sew it and then flip it to the outside and then top stitch so see how that's done in this clip I have my bodice here this is the neckline I'm gonna use this more structured fabric you can see it's nice I'll do quarters divide everything in four and then I'm going to sew this raw edge here onto the neckline. So essentially I decided this was going to be my wrong side of the dress. Although they're exactly the same, so it doesn't really matter. But if I had fabric where you could tell which was the right or the wrong, I would be pinning it like this onto the wrong side of the fabric. And I'm going to be sewing on the edge at a quarter of an inch, stretching this smaller binding to match the neckline and then this will just wrap around go over to the other side over to the right side of the dress and that's where I'm going to be top stitching it down I have the binding just pinned onto the neckline with four pins there 
and of course the neckline is larger underneath and as I sew I'm just going to be stretching the binding to fit the neckline. I'll be sewing them with a straight stitch at a quarter of an inch. That's how that's looking. So I've decided that this is going to be my wrong side. You know, it would look like it's the right side, but it's the wrong and it's because I like to turn things over and top stitch where I'm going to see, like on the right side. This is the right side of the bodice. The binding has been sewn in there and then comes over and wraps around the raw edge. And I have just hand basted that in place. So that's around the neckline, the armhole. I'm using the edge foot to sew this binding on the edge really neatly so that I don't have to freehand it and get all wonky. This is a valley knit dress from Sinclair Patterns that I used that technique with and it looks really nice and it was sewn on the inside and then flipped out to the outside and then sewn again with a straight stitch the same thing for the armhole and the neckline. So that gives a really, really clean result. And you know, I've almost 100% converted to reverse binding now because it's just so much easier to see what you're sewing on the right side of the fabric of where you're actually going to wear the garment. So I really, really enjoy that method now than the standard way of doing binding like I've shown you the other two garments. I really like this binding. I think being structured, it made it easy to put on this linky stuff. Now I'm going to show you one of my favorite ways to finish necklines, armholes, even wrap dresses, the bodice front that crosses over. And that is using a binding piece that you fold over onto itself. So it's like two layers. And then you sew that on and flip it to the inside. So there's no binding seen on the outside. It looks super neat, it always has a great result and I would suggest this method only when you're using lightweight fabrics like rayon spandex, ITY, I wouldn't use this method if I was using like a heavier cotton or ponty or that sort of thing. It gives a really clean result inside so let's see how that's done. This whole neckline here I have divided in quarters so I have my center back there marked with a pin, around there is the other quarter and around there. So I've got one section, two sections, three sections and four sections and the band is shorter of course to keep the tension and to help this neckline lie flat and not gape and I drafted my own uh, to match with the binding that I want to do. It's one and a half inches wide, if you can see on the cutting mat, one and a half inches wide and the total length here I got by measuring all this length of the neckline and multiplying by 85% so it's 15% shorter <laughs> and I've divided this also into four so all I'm going to do now is fold these wrong sides together like that and I've got my quarters marked there with red pins that I'm going to be matching onto the neckline and then I'll be stretching slightly the binding while I'm sewing it onto the neckline. Never stretching the neckline, just this so that they match and they're the same size. This is the neckline here, the center back there. And I've got my binding folded onto each other, wrong sides together. And I've matched those pins there. And then the next quarter of the binding I've matched to the quarter of the neckline. And from here I've matched to the end. Here you can see that the binding is slightly shorter and then I will have to stretch slightly the binding to sew this on. So I'll be doing this carefully all the way around. I'll be using a small seam allowance so that the binding ends up being about half an inch wide like that. That's the finished width I wanted because then it's going to be folded into the inside. I'll be just using a straight stitch for this and I'll be very careful to not stretch the neckline, just stretch the binding to match the length of the neckline slightly. Here's the center back there. Now I did have to do a little seam on the middle of this binding because the pattern piece was super long to cut on the fold and I didn't have a place on the fabric to cut it on the fold so I just have a sneaky seam there. This seam that attaches the binding to the neckline, I'm going to trim 
by half and then I'm going to fold this over on top of the seam allowance and understitch this binding on and then fold back and that will ensure that the binding is going to stay inside and not be visible on the neckline. So I've trimmed down that seam allowance and now I'm just going to understitch this. I've got the seam allowance there, I'm going to fold the binding on top of it, keeping the binding on top of the seam allowance and I'm going to sew on the edge. So that's how that understitching is going to look and then I'll be folding this binding towards the inside and that will ensure that I'm going to have a really clean edge there with no binding visible. It's going to be really clean there. So I'll just continue this and then fold that and top stitch. I've turned the binding onto the inside of the neckline. You can see it's a bit crumpled because the binding is a bit shorter but it's all fixable when you press it. I have already pressed this other side and it's looking really nice, really flat, really neat. I have hand basted that on so I don't have to worry about pins. So I'll just finish pressing this neckline and then I can just go ahead and top stitch the edge there carefully without stretching this out as I sew. That's how it's going to look on the inside. The narrow one there is under stitch. This is the one I'm sewing the binding on and on the right side it's just going to have one stitch there. This is the dress that I've shown there, how to do that and it looks so neat and so clean inside but the technique of dividing into quarters you see is repetitive, that is something you're seeing in all these techniques because it's something that they all share in common even for a wrap dress, you know. This is the bodice there that goes there, so that total length was divided in four and you saw how that was done. So I've used the same technique to finish the armholes that I used to finish the front here of this wrap bodice. And it's top stitched and under stitched and it's all good. Because I cut the binding shorter, you know, 85%, it's sitting nice and flat and flush to my body, like there's no gaping or anything. You know, and that's the length of a decision in bands or binding I make individually for each fabric and how I see it feels. You know, for other fabrics that don't stretch that much, I wouldn't make it 85% from the length. I'd probably make it 90. So it's just a thing about feel, you know, and I like how that looks there. If you cut that binding piece for this technique that for me standard is one and a half inches tall, fold it onto itself, sew it on with a quarter of an inch seam allowance, Flip it to the inside, it'll give you the right space to sew on there at 3 8 of an inch and it'll be super neat and a great result every time. Now if it's 80%, if it's 85 it'll depend on the fabric. I wouldn't go to 90% because I reserve 90% for structured fabrics and I wouldn't do this with a structured fabric. Now you saw that when I did this binding that is folded, I've just used my normal presser fold, I understitched, I top stitched, just normal freehand I would say but this could be made so much easier if you used your presser feet. This is one of the sleeveless armholes and I have sewn the binding onto it. The only thing I did was cut strips of four centimeters and I folded that onto itself wrong sides together that's why you can see that fold. I divided my band into quarters and the armhole into quarters and I've just sewn that on there. I've done the same with the neckline. I've just done a straight stitch there. I'm going to fold that and I'm going to understitch this there. And with my edge foot I'm going to go and sew along the edge and that will make this binding stay inside. And then on the inside it's going to look like that. And then I'm going to go ahead and top stitch that on. how it looks after the understitching the seam allowance is in the same direction of the binding and now when I fold this behind you're not going to see the binding on the outside so I'm just going to go ahead and do a quick hand basting all the way around and then I'm going to be top stitching that there and that will be the only visible stitch line that you're going to see on the outside just one row. I'm using my quarter inch foot with the needle 
moved over to the left so when you do that it goes into that little hole there and then the seam allowance that this gives you is three eighths instead of a quarter so i'm going to use that to sew this on so that it's very very even because the edge of the foot there guides you know your stitching because it goes against the edge of the fabric that means that on the outside my stitching is going to be really 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 neat okay there you can see the stitching line on the right side of the dress how it's exactly three eighths of an inch from the edge so on the outside it's going to look super neat and on the inside you can see the stitching goes right there so i'm actually not sewing anywhere near the basting stitches so that's good i can just pull that out easily so this is what i'm going to do for the neckline and the armholes don't you think this is starting to Now, what about structured fabrics? I have two ways to show you here. They are sort of the same but similar, but I'll show you how the talent dress is finished in the pattern instructions. And I would suggest that technique to be used with a ponte or a heavier cotton spandex. So let's see how that one's done. This is the pattern piece that's going to finish the neckline and I've just cut it on the fold as instructed. And now you're meant to take the short ends together put them together and then sew that with 3 8 of an inch. I have finished one of the sides because it's going to be left in the inside so I've searched one of the long ends and the other one's raw. That's the one that's going to go onto the neckline. I've sewn these together. You can see the 3 8 seam allowance there. I've just finger pressed this open. I've divided this in four. Now this one, I'm not going to leave it at the center back. It's just going to be like towards my shoulder seam, but not at the shoulder seam. It will never be seen with my hair. I have the neckline divided into four as well. I've got red pins there to mark where the quarters are. Center back, center front. And this, this one is on the front neckline. That's where the other quarter is. So I'm just going to grab these raw areas there. This is the right side of my fabric. So right sides to right sides and I'm going to match these quarters there. This one with that one. Now this neck piece is drafted to be just slightly smaller than the neckline, just slightly, not that much. I calculate it to be about 92%. So I've matched these up and now I'm just going to sew these together, stretching slightly the neck piece here just slightly and I'm going to sew that straight stitch with 3 8 seam allowance. You can see this seam here is towards the back neckline and I think it will be more discreet there. This is the shoulder seam that needs to be pressed towards the back so I've made sure it's heading that way. that's been sewn on I have done a few snips there for this curve and then I'm just gonna pull this piece up and I'm just gonna fold this over that seam allowance so I'm touching and I can feel the seam allowance right there and so that's gonna go towards the back there and I'm just gonna pin this there and look if I pin right there where these two meet you have all that at the back and that's really good because it's going to facilitate stitching in the ditch in there right there so i'm going to take my time to pin this and to hand baste it on and then i'm going to go ahead and stitch in the ditch and i love this technique for a more structured fabric but i love this for pontaroma i absolutely love the technique i've got the stitch in the ditch foot that little metal thing will be going against the fabric there and I do stitch in the ditch slow like I'm talking total slow and I even put the settings on my machine to sew really slow because I don't want to have this thread visible so I basically want to see where each of the stitches is going to go through with the needle and I want to manipulate this so I don't have any errors 
and I'm just gonna take my time and do this and I'll show you how it looks like when I'm done all the way around. I've stitched in the ditch and you can't even see it. I mean, it is in the ditch right there. So it's worth it to take your time. It's caught this on the other side and left a bit there like a quarter of an inch. That's good. It's very clean on the inside. And I think on the outside, it gives it a really elevated look. This hand basting didn't take any time at all. And I can just whip it out in a second. That's really nice. I love the finish of this. I don't give you measurements of what that pattern piece is because that's not correct. You see that it's using a 3 8 seam allowance. When you wrap over the raw edge, you have a tad protruding over the other side. So it's really easy to stitch in the ditch you're always gonna catch it because it's a little bit longer on the inside. So it's a very nice technique, very easy to do. It looks super elegant because there's no top stitching seen anywhere. So it's a really, really nice technique and I really enjoyed it. Now the other variation is to do something very similar but with a piece that's a little bit narrower. Once the shape of the armhole is finalized, you're happy with that, you can measure the circumference of the armhole 3 8 of an inch away from the edge cut a long binding piece that is an inch tall and that will be 90% of the circumference because this fabric is pretty structured, it's pretty thick. I don't want it to be that much shorter. One of those edges has been surged because that will go to the inside and I really want that to look neat. The raw edge is the one that you're going to match to the armhole. You do need to stretch the binding slightly to match the armhole and I'm using 3 8 of an inch seam allowance there to just straight stitch this down. This width is actually going to be the visible width of the binding because the binding will be folded over that seam allowance. I have done a few snips there to help this go around the curves. And then that binding will get flipped over the seam allowance. You can see it over it. You're not trying to get rid of the seam allowance to the back. And that's how you determine how wide that binding is going to be. So I'm just pinning that around. I will of course hand baste this down so I can edge stitch this without pins. It's much easier to sew without pins. I've lengthened my stitch length to 3.5 for this specific one because it is quite bulky. It is Pontiroma. It's quite thick, the layers that you have to sew through. And the edge stitch with the needle to the left gives a really, really clean result. And you have the surged edge of this binding towards the inside. So what you saw me doing there was the edges here of my black wood cardigan that I hacked to be sleeveless. So I completely changed the armhole, totally reshaped it, everything. So I had to go ahead and measure that, calculate. And for binding pieces that are made out of a really structured fabric, I just cut them an inch tall and then whatever length I need, 90%, and sew that onto the garment with a 3 8 seam allowance. Then I'll wrap over to the inside. One of the edges will be surged, of course, the one that will go to the inside. And it'll be sort of on the edge. So I've done that with this Tessa sheath dress from Love Notions. And that's how I finished the neckline and the um, holes there. So you can see the surged edge there. It's not folded in there. It's just a surged edge. And this is less bulky than having to fold it again. And it's just adapting to the fabric type. These are more heavyweight knits. So I don't want to have the inside folded. I don't need it to be. A surge the edge will be okay. So I hope this video was not too dizzying, too many numbers. I hope you got the practicalities out of it. And I hope you can uh, jot down some of these things that I use for standards. And you can try to use them on patterns you are making for yourself. You know, you don't need to think, oh, you know, that neckline's too high. I'm not into that. You can lower it. Or if you think a certain pattern has a neckline that's too low, you can change it. You know, if you can do so many things, there's just so many possibilities with patterns and having all these options and ways to finish all these edges in different ways can just give you so many more possibilities and the sky is the limit. You can do whatever you like. You can make the garments look like you want them to look. So I really hope this was helpful and I hope you have fun changing your necklines, putting on bands, doing bindings and that you're not scared of these things because they are not hard to do. They have the same concept for necklines that you mark quarters, you mark quarters on bindings or neck bands, you match them, you stretch the binding or band to match, you sew. It's all very, very similar concepts between them. It's just tiny differences between all these different things. So you can achieve really good things, you can achieve nice things, and I hope you give them a go. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again with more sewing. Bye.